When I was a music major in college, whenever I wasn't watching gaming videos on YouTube, I was watching videos of musical performances that are going to be so much better than anything I myself could ever do. Now these would range from things like acapella arrangements, to barbershop quartets, concert bands, choirs, pianists. It allowed me to view the vast array of colors different kinds of groups can make with their instrumentation and I have seen countless videos that just blow me away time and time again. But one of my favorite videos that I've ever seen was a video by the YouTube channel Player Piano, I'll leave the link in the iCard up above, where the pianist, Sonia Belasova, had to listen to iconic Nintendo themes and then come up with an arrangement of what she just heard. This is from a series on the channel called On The Spot, and I'm always just so blown away by her godlike talent whenever I watch those videos. In that video, she had to listen to the Moon theme from DuckTales on the NES, and it, it was so incredibly popular that they filmed an entire video of just her playing that piece. And you can actually even go onto musicnotes.com and buy the sheet music of her arrangement. Now, this is definitely one of my favorite piano renditions, but it's also just one of my absolute favorite game pieces of all time. Now, I actually didn't experience DuckTales until I played the remastered version a few years after it came out in 2013, but it is undeniably one of the most iconic NES games of all time, which is actually kind of odd knowing how unsuccessful a lot of video games based on movies or TV shows tend to be. In this game, you play as Scrooge McDuck, and you're basically just trying to get a whole bunch of money and stop Magicka Dispel from just ruining your life while you're also traversing loads of unique and interesting environments. But then you're able to go to the moon, and you get to experience why the music that plays during that stage is such a masterpiece. I think one of the best things about it is the overall tonality of it. I know not everyone thinks the same way that I do, but when I think of games or levels that take place in outer space, hashtag bars, I'm always thinking of games like Alien Isolation, or Doom, or Dead Space, before I even consider thinking of games like Super Mario Galaxy. Space is this mysterious, vast world that we've been exploring and studying for years, yet we're still discovering new things in it, and we're developing even more questions about it. So to me, it's totally logical to give music in a space setting this overall mysterious and unsettling vibe. So when I first heard the music of the moon, and it sounded so adventurous, it felt a little out of left field at first, but in the best ways possible. So, real quick, I'm just gonna let you guys listen to some pieces from games like Alien Isolation, Doom, and Dead Space, and then I'm gonna compare it to a little bit of what the moon theme sounds like. One of the ways that this piece sounds so adventurous is actually through the key signature of F sharp major. Now I've discussed this in the past, but essentially the more sharps you have in a key signature, the brighter the overall tone is going to be, whereas having more flats would give you a much darker tone. 
So in this piece, we actually have a key signature of F sharp, which is six different sharps, F sharp, C sharp, G sharp, D sharp, A sharp, and E sharp, while also actually modulating or changing keys mid song to A major. So we're getting a little bit darker towards the middle part of the piece. But, you know, we still have a lot of sharps going on here, at least three throughout the entire piece. So yeah, we're going to be sounding pretty bright throughout this entire thing. Another thing that helps keep the piece really interesting is the constant change of time signatures at the very beginning of the piece. A time signature is the fraction that you see located after the key signature and clef signature. Now, the numerator, or the top number, tells you how many beats are in one measure whereas the denominator tells you what note equals one beat. Common denominators that you're going to see are four, which symbolizes that the quarter note equals one beat, and eight, which symbolizes that the eighth note equals one beat. These are typically, like I said, the most common denominators you'll see, but you might also run into denominators of two, where the half note equals one beat, and 16, where the 16th note equals one beat. You might notice that it's actually easier to recognize what note gets one beat the higher the denominator, as they tend to just correspond with their respective notes. So notice how we're starting off with a pretty steady 4-4 four, four time signature. So we have four beats in one measure, with the quarter note equaling one beat. But then we transition immediately to a measure of 7-8, which means that the eighth note is getting one beat, and we have seven beats in a measure. So the way that we would count this would be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four. This really helps throw off the listener, especially since the opening is being played all in eighth notes. It's a bit difficult to notice a change in time signature until it's actually already happened. And that's why I love time signatures in seven, solely because of the anticipation that it creates when listening to it. Going from 4-4 four, four to a measure of 7 leaves the listener thinking that they're going to hear just another comfortable measure of 4-4. Four, four. But we're skipping a beat entirely, leaving this odd feeling of emptiness as the piece continues. I think this is incredibly fitting for the piece, because it still leaves that hint of mysteriousness that I was referring to, but just behind a incredibly jolly tone. The piece begins with this eighth note run that continues for the first ten measures of the piece, which is also referred to as an ostinato, which is just a musical phrase that is being constantly continued throughout a piece. The ostinato slightly changes once the piece goes primarily into 4-4 at measure 11, but it still continues throughout the entire piece. This helps keep a sense of familiarity to the listener, allowing them to hear that opening phrase while the main melody begins, which actually also creates a counterpoint between the two parts. I also love the notation of these phrases, starting off on the tonic of F and rising to some high notes like the 9th and 11th of the scale. It kind of symbolizes the idea of being grounded on Earth and going into space to get to the moon. It's actually a really nice touch. Now about halfway through the piece, like I said, we actually modulate to A major, but we also have this incredible slide into the B section, which I love. It really helps the overall transition from the previous section to the B section. It's kind of like a drum fill in a way. When you're listening to a drum groove, moving from that standalone groove to a new type of groove on a different cymbal or tom it sounds kind of weird to the listener. It's very rough, so to speak. So you need the assistance of a drum fill in order to make that transition smoother. That's what the slide up to the B section provides to this piece, a smooth, clean transition. Towards the end of the B section, we actually hear the original line from the beginning of the piece in order to help us transition back into measure 11. But 
But let's talk about the B section, actually. The overall rhythmic feel of this section is a lot different from what we're used to now. We're hearing rhythms with a lot of breaks in between, as well as faster rhythms in order to maintain the overall intensity of the piece. The low and high parts tend to be in unison, as well as in the segments where eighth notes are being played on the first and third beats, as well as the end of four, providing lots of harmony and some more power to that rhythmic moment. But you might actually be wondering why I just called this middle section the B section. Well, typically in music, we need some kind of new idea in order to spice things up and make the piece more interesting to listen to. Looking at the very beginning of the piece, we would consider this the A section, since it's the first musical idea that we are exposed to. At measure 11, we're being exposed to a slightly different musical idea, but we still have the musical line from the very beginning playing in the background, so we would consider this section to be A prime. Whenever you play a specific musical phrase multiple times, something about it needs to be different. And that difference, in this case, is the slightly different notation of the beginning line being solely in 4-4, four, four, not bouncing back and forth between 4-4 four, four, and 7-8. So once we finish our A prime section, chances are the listener is going to want to hear something completely different. They don't want to listen to the same musical idea throughout the entire song. And that's where the B section comes in. It gives us a fresh new musical idea completely different from what we've already become accustomed to. Now earlier I mentioned that we actually transition back to the original melody after the B section, which generally means that we're going back to A, meaning that this song is in an A, A, B, A pattern. Now this is a very typical type of melodic pattern many songs use, not even in video games, but it still keeps everything nice and interesting while listening to the piece. However, there can be times where you do A, A prime, A double prime, or you go to B and then you go straight to C. This is a kind of thing that is constantly changing between different songs. And with that, we're going to actually conclude the video. I hope you all enjoyed and learned something. I actually had an absolute blast being able to go back and listen to this absolute icon of a piece and talk about it. So if you enjoyed, be sure to leave a like down below and subscribe for more if you're into these uh, music analysis videos I'm doing. Also, I do have a few announcements, so please make sure that you stay till the end of the video. Not sure if you guys follow me on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, links in, this, in the description, but I've actually started streaming on Twitch TV a while ago. So the link is going to be twitch.tv slash themurfination, T-H-E-M-U-R-P-H-I-N-A-T-I-O-N. And I'm going to be streaming every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 p.m. as of right now. And each day I stream a specific game. So Mondays is Telltale's The Walking Dead. I'm actually going to be finishing up that game relatively soon. Wednesdays is going to be Dark Souls 1. And Fridays is what I'm actually most excited about. It's a Pokemon Extreme Randomizer Nuzlocke of Emerald. So in that, I basically randomized everything. I randomized the starters. I randomized the Pokemon that you encounter. I randomized the types of the Pokemon. I randomized the moves that they learn the types of the moves that they learn. So for example, uh, my starter Pokemon knows the move Sludge Bomb, but in this randomizer, it's considered a steel move. Uh, speaking of those moves, I actually completely randomized the power and accuracy of the moves. Oh, my dog is barking upstairs. Oh, fantastic. Hopefully you guys can't hear that. Uh, and I also completely changed base stats 
and I also changed the evolutions. So a Pokemon can get to level 6 and evolve into something completely random. But basically, the reason why I'm advertising this is to just g give you guys perfect blackmail material to use on me. It's gonna be great, it's gonna be great. Secondly, I'm also trying to develop a schedule for YouTube as well, in order to give myself a bit of consistency. I figured that if I'm trying to be consistent with Twitch, I should be consistent with this too. I did take a bit of a mental health break a while back, but I think what I'm going to try and do is have a new music-based video every other week on Saturdays, while also possibly doing a highlight reel of some of the things that happened that week in streaming. But of course, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, so let me know what you think in the comments down below. Finally, my really good friend Mark Tully, link in the description, just released his very first single to kick off his work as a solo artist. The piece is called Black Heart, and I strongly recommend checking him out because he is an absolutely incredible musician. He actually also just put up a uh, guitar playthrough of his song. So the link to all that will be in the description below, and I'll put up the link in the iCard. Again, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.